Kia ora and welcome to today's episode of the Niche Cast, where we're reacting to a Black Caps semi final victory at the T20 World Cup. Pretty crazy game, and we're just going to spend uh, a decent podcast having a yarn about the Black Caps defeating England. Jolly old times here in Aotearoa. We, every Monday and Friday, we deliver a email banger straight into your email inbox. No dramas, no fuss. You just uh, have a little refresh. Our niche cage pops up with some Kiwi sporting information. You get all the niche cage content straight to email as well as extra bonus yarns as well. Go there to the nichecage.substack.com, sign up, chirp. And we also have a Patreon page where you can support the niche case directly, straight up the guts. You get good karma, you get an extra podcast, and you get to have a cordial, just a typing cordial with us on the Patreon page. You sign up there, patreon.com forward slash our niche case. And of course, we're always writing about our Tero sports at the niche case, uh, the niche dash case.com. Wobbly wildcard. We are going to start with some mindfulness. Let's just slow down. Let's just uh, relax. It's been a uh, hectic morning. We had the Black Caps win. Then uh, we had a power outage here in Auckland. And so I went out for a walk and I blew a jandal. Blew a jandal on my walk as well. And here we are. So it's a pretty eventful Thursday morning. Lost some jandals. Power wasn't such a big deal. Black Caps won a game. So hopefully you can deliver some mindfulness to um, amplify that notion of this being a fucking strange but glorious Thursday morning. So what you're saying is you had to, um, the, the, the jandal and the time without power was sort of like your um, karmic sacrificial offering to, to get the Black Caps over the line in that game. Like without that blown jandal, maybe Johnny Besto's knee wouldn't have wouldn't have brushed the um wouldn't have brushed the rope there, and that would have been out instead of six. No, because I think all of that black caps karmary type of stuff was already well and truly on its way. Like there wasn't anything I could do to change that. You know, I just thought of like you know you're out for a walk, you got to take off the jandals mid walk. And so then you're barefoot, you're connecting to the earth, no, no electricity means you're, you're grounding yourself there as well. So, but I think a lot of that stuff in the game versus England was coming to England. So don't think I was going to do anything to help or stop that. But please serve up some mindfulness. Yes, the mindfulness comes from a fellow called Isamo Noguchi, who I understand is a Japanese-American, or was a Japanese-American uh, sculptor, artist, something something or other of some sort, um, some description, and nice and simple one. Um, three words, handful of syllables. Appreciate the moment. Just thought it was a nice one after the Black Caps one, getting into you know another ICC tournament final, just like, we're going to spend a, a fair bit of time probably here just talking about that game and, and how it happened and everything about that and looking backwards. Just, you know, chuck one out at the top to say, appreciate the moment. Take a second, few deep breaths. Uh, enjoy what the Black Caps just accomplished and, and just uh, regardless of what might happen in the final, just like sort of, you know, wade in that, wade in those waters. What what comes to mind in that process is just the the gratitude for having a world class cricket team, because for a long time, for sure, in our lifetimes, our cricket team was just weird. They weren't like overly shit, but they had shit moments. They weren't overly great, but they had some great moments. They had some great cricketers. There was a lot of very strange international cricketers, as well as very strange international cricketing moments. Um, and here we are, best test team in the world back-to-back -back ODI World Cup finals, T20 World Cup final. That's a world-class cricket team. But to sum up this game, we're going to go to our Patreon. Um, generous supporter of the Niche Cage, Baxter Rogers, got a good summary here just to start us off on the conversation. He says, great to see that throughout this tournament, different players have stepped up when needed, especially today when our best players failed to fire Guppy, Trent and Kane. Southie was great. And just the way we absorbed all the pressure and stayed in the contest, even though when it looked like a tough get with five overs to go, we kept wickets in hand 
and I believe the Black Caps knew they could get 60 off the last five as long as they were in the contest and they did that which was great to see glad I got up for this one also enjoyed seeing Mitchell grind it out and even though he was finding it hard early on he reaped the benefits at the end of not going for too much too early in his innings so um great summary from Baxter Rogers what are your initial like bounce back thoughts uh from that well I think Simon Dill said something similar about the the 60 off five um at the end of the innings and because definitely they got themselves in a position where like at 10 for two um you you can't win the game in the next five overs after that but you can lose the game in the next five overs of Mitchell and Conway and then you know Phillips on top of that get out like we needed to um we we didn't need like 2020 is a a little bit of a fickle sport um particularly within cricket which itself can be a, a fickle sport where like you don't, and it comes back to the first point that Baxter made there as well. Like you, the, how good it is that so many players have stepped up over because you don't need everyone to fire to win a twenty twenty. You need a couple, um, and in this case, like the margin for error slims when two of your top three batsmen get out cheaply early on, um, that meant we did need a partnership after that, and it meant we did somehow need to like. I once it got to a point where it was sort of like. Um, I don't know, 30 to like, uh, well, basically after Jimmy Nation's big over at that point, I was like, okay, now if he were to get out um, or if Mitchell were to get out, I'd kind of back the, um, I'd I'd back the likes of um, Santner, Saudi, Sodi coming in, Um, Milne as well can can swing about a little bit. Um, I'd back them to get over the line just by like standing there and hitting every third, like just, tr- just trying to hit boundaries, you know, it's close enough that they could get there. They weren't going to do that with like 60 to win um, of, of a longer time necessarily. Um, but yeah, the, the, the 60 runs off the last five overs. Um, I, I, yeah. I think it was Simon Dool said something like, like set them a target similar to that um, during the game. Um, what actually happened is I think they scored 60 off, I think three overs with it and still had an over to spare on the end of that. It was something like that. It was, it was ridiculous because very few times, basically no time. Uh, I mean, even after Nisham's over that got them back into the hunt for sure, but it was, wasn't really until, um, Daryl Mitchell with those two sixes where I felt like for the first time in the entire game, the black caps are kind of on top here. They'd always been just slightly behind, not as far behind maybe as the, um, uh, the overwhelming English voices in the in the commentary seem to suggest um, when they were like 35 without loss and like what a what a great start this is for England wickets in hand and the power play it's like but they're not scoring much over like a run of ball it was really just and they wouldn't have been at all if it wasn't for that one Trent Bolt um, bouncer that went over the top for for five wides um, I'm, I'll try and check what they actually got over those last few overs because it was absolutely ballistic but yeah there's um a couple a couple points in there is is they exceeded expectations in the death with the bat which was crazy because i mean we we know they've had that capability but i think also like it was gonna be nisham or it was gonna maybe be phillips um to do that probably more likely nisham just because of the bowlers they were facing i think like you know once chris jordan came in for that over and he started like you know, all his boundary riders on the leg side being like, I'm going to try to cramp you up. And I'm like, Jimmy Nisham's zone is square of the wicket on the leg side. Like, you, you t- I mean, it might, it's, it's a good option against any batsman if you can get the delivery right. But you're, you're dicing with danger there to Jimmy Nisham because all he has to do is lift it over the top. He's a strong bastard. Um, and he did a couple of times, just, just enough for that one with uh, the best though catch. And, you know, um, I think there was the Chris Jordan had one earlier on in the innings as well, where he sort of tried to flick it back, tried to catch it and flick it back. He wasn't ever going to catch it, but like thought he had saved six, but it landed on the rope. Um, a few of those little moments that were nice to see go the Black Caps way this time, because there were a whole lot of them that piled up against them in that in that uh, um, World Cup final we were back. But um, I don't know. I, that's, it felt like a really Black Capsy win. Um, it felt gutsy. It felt like they were just trying to keep in the game until a point where they felt like they could have a little bit more of a of control over things. Um, like, just don't lose it. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. Now we go out and try to win it. I think winning the toss and bowling first was important because I think you see it the latter stages of that innings where the Black Cats were chasing just how much um, the 
the batting the team that bats second kind of has an advantage in a close game because you you know that England might have swung it a little bit more wildly and caught a few more top edges for four or six or something at the at the um, sort of middle or late stages of their innings if they knew they absolutely needed another 10 runs or something. Blackcaps knew exactly what they needed and were able to pace themselves around that um, and therefore also didn't panic when it got a little bit frisky, um, not so much in the middle, but in the in the earlier stages. Like just, just Blackcaps areas from top to bottom there, that's how they go out to try win a game. And it was also how, how England go out to try and win a game is to like... Um, it's to you know, put up big totals and then hit a lot of sixes and um, the Black Caps bowling. I think it's I assume that was probably the highest total they've given up in this in this tournament. Um, and they weren't great at all stages. There were a lot of overs there where it was like five good deliveries was ruined by like a sixth ball that went for four or something. Um, but they also didn't get pummeled. You know, they they it was the same thing of just like hanging the fight. So I think it was in this in a like. It's a chuck a boxing metaphor, like the styles make fights type of thing. If it was a clash of styles between how England want to go out and win a game, how New Zealand want to go out and win a game, it turned out to be New Zealand's style of game and New Zealand got over the line. That's that's how the Black Caps do it. It kind of played out exactly how, like, from an England perspective, you were saying it would. They batted and they scored, like, not a huge amount of runs, but that's something we'll touch on. It's Definitely 50, but, a defendable total, though, yeah. But they, they went out and they batted large. Like, some of the RPOs that the Black Caps bowlers are dealing with are much more than they've, they had in every game except, like, Pakistan. And that was the England being England. They're there to smack boundaries. And then you also were saying bowlers give up a lot of runs. So mm. it's like we're dealing with, like, these, these wonder 2020 death bowlers that – you know, Jordan is and whoever else they're using, Wokes and that. But like, um, they were terrible at the death. <laughs> they so much that's, better that's, at the that's who they cool. are, as you said. Like in your preview, you said this is who they are. They give up a lot of runs. So England yeah, scored a lot the, of the runs. The asterisk on that is that they give up a lot of runs expecting to take a lot of wickets. That's probably where the Black Cats won that battle, as they did after losing two early ones. They, you know, they got a big partnership there for another, for about 10 overs after that. But like, like simply put, England did what England do. They scored mm, runs yeah. and they conceded uh, runs bowling. And then generally put, New Zealand did what they want they do because they managed to keep some kind of lid on England's runs. Like Tim Saudi right now in this World Cup, his RPO was 5.75, which is ridiculous. After six games. <laughs> For just a, like a medium up and down pacer. Who has like obviously he's got tricks. That's why he's he's fantastic. But New Zealand, England did do what they do with the bat, but it wasn't two hundred plus. It was one hundred and sixty odd. And then New Zealand do what they do with the bat and just like um, building through an in innings, lose early wickets. What do you got to do to have wickets in the end? You got to conserve your energy, conserve your smashing it around, and build a partnership. And oh, where do we begin from? The, um, let's go with the the batting innings a bit more. And it was, I found it interesting because like Daryl Mitchell, it was that over against Livingston. And I have clear visions of Mitchell, very good straight down the ground. He just leans into sixes with a straight bat down the ground. Like you see it a lot in the Super Smash. Obviously, it's easier for him. He's dropping down to the Super Smash level. Fantastic straight down the ground but he couldn't do anything off Livingston. And then what else does Daryl Mitchell do that's really well? Fantastic square of the wicket. So it's like, yeah, like, yeah, you're Mark Wood. You're going to bowl 145 Ks and bowl short and all that's that's fine. But Daryl Mitchell's going to hit it. Whether he top edges it or if he hits it for six, he's going to hit it. Oh, Chris Wokes, you want to bowl short. Like I've seen Daryl Mitchell do this stuff in the Super Smash for seasons now. And it's what he does best. He plays very straight, and that's why he's fantastic in all formats. You want to bowl short, he'll pull you. He's one of the best, like, I'd say there's not too many that just, like, score as many runs as him and are as quick on the pull shot as him in New Zealand. So he did, like, everything is kind of to the script, right? Like, England were to the script. New Zealand were to the script. In my opinion, Daryl Mitchell was to the script of, of who he is. Like, no one was like, hoping 
we're hoping for Guppy and Williamson and that, but um, but he's also a very quality batsman, so he can build an innings. Same with Conway. And even if they were there, like if Conway's faced 50 deliveries, he's banging sixes at the end. You know, like that's what you saw with Mitchell. Like Mitchell got in and then they just play there like they have a bit of fun. Where Nisham, pure strike rate genius. Like his strike rates from the last 12 months are monstrous. Um, and it was just the from front to back, it just seemed like everything was to the DNA of like the player or the even Williamson didn't score runs, but I think he was tactically and spiritually the better leader. Like you watch as soon as Nisham went bang, England just fucking they were finished. So Simon Dill, as well as mentoring like big boy runs every fucking second, he um he highlighted Joss Butler, like Joss Butler, like it was a little thing, but you could see it. Like uh, Jordan Boulder wide, and then it's just kind of yeah. the ball back to cover. That type of stuff was there, and they just didn't really respond. But that's that's the New Zealand thing, where New Zealand's like, I think they're just better mentally than a lot of teams as well. Yeah, they um, they sort of set themselves up to be that way. I think England England are out there trying to be the the favourites, the leaders, the dictating play and stuff. Whereas the Black Caps are a lot more adaptable so when things were on script for england for 35 out of 40 overs maybe not like as far on script as they would hope for but still like that where they were probably the the team sort of pushing things um when it changed it changed in a hurry didn't it it changed all because once you know nisham was what's the thing oh they it was 57 runs they needed off the last four overs um 57 off 24 at that point it's like 15 and over or something. And, um, you know, they threw it with an over to spare. Uh, where is the where is the over with Chris? So, yeah, the first ball went for six. Um, second ball, full on the pads, sneak through for a couple leg buys. Suddenly that's eight runs off two balls. Balls are wide down leg side. Nishim is the guy who you know, doesn't chase after it. He stands there. Um, you know, watches it down and says, we'll take the free run. I've already hit a big six this over. Um, Carves a four, was it? Yeah, sort of towards long on region. Um, The next one, bowls another wide, I think outside off stump. Like when you've bowled within, um, what, three legitimate deliveries and you've already bowled a wide on either side of the batsman, you're rattled at that point, aren't you? Like, that's when you're starting to think, I just got to get out of this over. I got to, I got to find a way. Or whatever. And then, you know, the next ball was the, um, was the besto to Livingston catch. That wasn't, that was actually six, um, which I thought at the time, man, I thought that was just an amazing piece of fielding. And then you see it back. Cause he didn't actually, it's not like he stood over the line. His leg just brushed the, um, like his knee brushed the rope. It was crazy. Um, well, if it's an actual like, rope, would you one of those? If it's a rope. It's a yeah, catch. yeah. If it's not the Toblerones, yeah, it would have been. Um, and it's probably, uh, oh, I mean, if it was a rope, I think the Chris Jordan one would have still landed on it, but that, that was weird as well. The Chris Jordan one because it clearly did land on the rope. And then, um, Danny Morrison's sitting there in the in the commentary just being like, that looks good to me. And I'm like, does it? <laughs> does it really? I don't know. I mean, you might want to look a little bit closer there, Danny. Um, oh, yeah, I've they won't make a joke about him just being on cocaine or anything, but whatever. Like, it's, there's there was a couple of those moments that just like um, I think I think when you talk about like the game being um, I have to put my head on because my head's disappearing in the thing. Um, when you like talk about the game being mostly on like England mostly got the game that they were wanting to play. New Zealand mostly got the game that they were wanting to play. Like they found that overlap between the two teams then it really does in a 20 over contest. It really does come down to small moments like that. Um, and we know these two teams are evenly matched and it's just a lot of those small moments. Um, uh, it, it's not that they all went towards New Zealand because there were a lot in the first innings where it was like, um, you know, they got two extra runs because Glenn Phillips slipped over instead of taking the catch um, on the last ball of the innings. There were a couple, like quite a few, probably like four or five throughout the innings where it was like, a ball was semi skied and it would land safely for England. Um, and they'd just get away with them like that. And, and a couple like, um, 
you know, some of those Dalwood Milan shots uh, through cover where it was just like, um, you know, perfect. Like that middle uh, long off was quite wide and you had like a deep cover and he was just piercing them perfectly. It's like, there's not, a, there's not a big margin for error to be able to hit that shot as well. And he was just pumping boundaries every time in the area. It was like, that's some high level, like um, tightrope walk and batting there. And little thing like the, it adds up over the course of the game though, to where like both teams are executing at a high level, but a few little mistakes end up being, um, end up being crucial. And that is where I think it, it, yeah, again, like I just, I just think the team that bats second there is a, is a big advantage in that type of game. You talked about Nisham sitting and it's, that is where Nisham hits boundaries. Like if you could have a career wagon wheel for Nisham and T20 cricket, I think it would be heavily skewed towards the league side. And yep, like for sure, and a little bit down the ground. Yeah, but the like the plan there, you got a lot of uh, you got a full leg side field, and you're bowling just length. Because if you if you're going to bowl Yorkers. I'm not sure you'd put the whole league side back, you know, you might change it a bit, but I don't, um, yeah, it was just like, there was a graphic at one point about how England's, um, in fact, a couple of times I hammered at home a little bit earlier on in the innings about how England had like, they'd lived and died off of a sort of back of a length, um, sort of pace bowling strategy. They'd, they'd had a lot of success with that. Um, but I mean, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that their group prepared them too well for what New Zealand were up um, yeah. with different little different levels of strengths, I think, um, between those two teams. But yeah, well, I think it's it's one thing for Mark Wood because yeah, he does bowl 145 and blah, like all of that. Chris Jordan is more of a crafty seam. He's more of a Tim Salvey. Mm-hmm. Um, but the well, it's interesting you you mentioned that about the England like their kind of tactics. They did have the clipboard though, clipboard <laughs> on the boundary. I'm not sure what the number one was, but the fucking yeah, number what do you one reckon? didn't work. That, that... I was guessing, I'm not sure if it was a strategy. I At first I was just assuming like these are the bowlers you should bowl next or something like that. Like these are the matchups. And I was just, so I was trying to figure was, out like, be well, like three, like, does that mean Rashid or, you know, like, one you know is how, that um, back to Wokes? What I've heard about NFL coaches, they'll have like all their plays out, but it'll be like um, categorized by situation. Yeah. So I need like third and short, we need this. Second yeah. and long, we need this. I think it was like that type of thing, but cricket where it's like number one just represents a situation that we've discussed previously. Not sure number one like meant like get smashed everywhere. <laughs> but it was yeah, what you're saying about the prep stuff, like I'm like yeah, fair play. Daryl Mitchell, bit of an unknown. But if you've seen Daryl Mitchell bat in domestic cricket, like First of all, as I wrote earlier in the tournament, it's no surprise that Daryl Mitchell's here. Um, Williamson said in the Test Match Special podcast this morning, um, he said it's not a like a surprise or a um, like a bolter type of thing. Yeah, experiment. I think was the yeah. It's not an experiment on based on Daryl Mitchell's character. Mm. So that's basically Kane Williamson saying Daryl Mitchell is like just. He's a very good batsman who, and you can see it in his technique. His technique is designed for everything. But he's good against spin. He's good against seam. This is why he scored a lot of runs in New Zealand to this point. This point is like a apex for Daryl Mitchell, but he's been building towards it. And yeah, just watching him a lot in New Zealand, best player of the short ball among the best. Ken McClure is pretty damn good in the Plunkett Shield. Three sixes off, uh, two sixes off Ben Sears. And I think both of them were over third man and slip. But Dale Mitchell loves it. And like, again, yeah, you might have this plan about short bowling because that's what like Australia are doing as well with Josh Hazelwood. Yeah. Like a lot, Hazelwood. These seamers are bowling more test matchy and it's working because there's a bit, of, bit in a, on the pitch. Um, but I'm, I'm not like designing a plan to bowl short Daryl Mitchell. Like I'm not, I'm not, my plan isn't to bowl a length on the league side to Jimmy Nisham. Like 
those are some strange plans if you've got knowledge of what they're actually doing. And they would because both of them played T20 Blast in England. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it gets, there was someone at one point, it was, it was one of the English voices, it was either Atherton or Hussein said something like, they showed that thing of um, how Glenn Phillips has hit more sixes than anyone else this calendar year. Um, and next up was uh, Livingston. And they're like, well, I think Phillips has probably dined in on a lot of short boundaries in New Zealand. And I'm like, no, he hasn't actually. He's been playing in the Caribbean. He's been playing a little IPL. He's been playing a lot of blast, which is exactly where you should have seen a lot of these sixes flying. Well, that, no, that's, that was, I think that's, that was international, though, wasn't it? Was it no, it was all 2020s because he kind of hit 90 something in, um, in purely I'd black say, caps I'd games. say most of them were in England because he had a strike rate of like almost 200 over the whole tournament. And so, when he, because he scored 100 for the Black Caps last year, didn't he? Um, but that was pre-Christmas. So that wasn't this calendar year. So that doesn't even count. I, I can't remember if he had any massive innings after that, but that was his big one last summer for the Black Caps. Like, it's just, it, the, the point probably stands for all of them as well. I know Daryl Mitchell. Um, there was a good story I saw about um, a fella over my shoulder here, old Papa John. Um, because you know, he used to, he was the defense coach, the defensive coach for the England rugby team up until like a couple months ago. Um, and I didn't realize he'd left because I don't follow rugby close enough. Um, but I saw a story going around, it was a, um, about how he like how he fell out with uh, Eddie Jones, was it, it was his day off. Um, and he was gonna go to watch the cricket and see Daryl play because he was playing for, um, uh, I forget which county team he was playing for, but he's, you know, he's going to go watch a, a blast game or something. Um, and Eddie Jones is like, no, you're not. I've got some work for you to do. And John Mitchell says, well, actually, it's my day off. So I'm going to go watch my son play cricket. And Eddie, Eddie Jones says, well, you know, <laughs> I, I need this done. This is what's going to happen. And he says, well, not, no, it's not. And he left. Um, and before, like very shortly after that, they said he would be leaving his post at the end of the November internationals. But then he actually ended up leaving his post a couple of days after that announcement back in July, I think it was. So um, the ability to watch his son play rugby is more to do with Eddie Jones being a dickhead in that situation. But the, uh, the ability to watch his son play cricket um, was a major reason why he's not in that job. And because he's not in that job, he's not with the England rugby team right now. So he could be there in, um, in the UAE to watch his son play cricket there as like the, what will potentially be the highlight of his son's career as well um, with that innings, along with uh, just behind him were the, the Conways. Um, you see them in the thing in their teal shirts. And then on the other side of the pitch, I think were the entire all white squad who had been training like, on the on the field behind this one like at the um part of the wider complex and then they just all popped up like all of them they were all there it was awesome i was trying to get a good screenshot of the all whites for the for my background but um very hard to screenshot stuff these days because all the apps just block you now you get a black screen it's annoying um and the highlight packages just don't don't keep all the random crowd shots and i'm not sure the directors of the like icc production quite knew who they were because there wasn't a lot i just wanted you know, when Jimmy Nation pumps a massive six, let's see what Joe Bell's doing. <laughs> let's see if Sapri sings up off his seat or whatever. I know they all just had a training session and it's in the heat and whatever, um, but they were definitely getting rowdy by the end of it. There's, a, I think, um, Craig Henderson put a, he must be with the squad for some reason on the staff. Um, he put up a video of them all celebrating when Mitchell hit the winning runs. There was a story on Chris Wood's Instagram as well. Um, war whites were getting rowdy they were getting amongst it and, but they were all there as well it looked like every one of the squads so nice to see um at a time where obviously most of the um you know there's limited limited opportunities for fans to get to these games somehow you get a bit of like um kiwi cross sport uh whatever the word would be support um, both from the rugby community and former all blacks coach and then the the national football team was bloody lovely so the Mitchell, John Mitchell, case study in serendipity. The Conways just love seeing the passion for Aotearoa. Like you get a bit beat down, like people liking Aotearoa. Seems like a lot of people in Aotearoa don't actually like Aotearoa. So it's good when you see if like a family, like even Devin Conway, part of the team, Conway parents fucking loved it. And it was beautiful. Um, and the All Whites just imagine that, like, you finish training, you walk, 
and you watch one of the greatest cricket games you'll see. Fantastic. But I, I have wonder a how many of them were up for it. Like, I, I, oh, they're all obviously going to sure. enjoy a good sporting occasion. I just wonder how many of them are like hardcore cricket fans. Um, because I, like, I know Ollie Sale played a lot of cricket. He's obviously not with the team though. I know Declan Wynn played cricket because he played against my brother once, but it, I don't think, um, you know, he's he's not in that squad either. Like, I'm. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if many of these, because you'd imagine a bunch of them would have played as kids for sure. Like it, it would have half the All Blacks played cricket when they were kids. So like stands to reason the All Whites would have as well. I have a question. How many players in the T20 blast hit more than 25 sixes? Uh, one, Glenn Phillips. How many sixes did Glenn Phillips hit as the only player in the T20 Blast to hit more than 25 sixes? Uh, I'm just glad I got the first guess right. Um, I'm guessing he went a little over um, 33. 36. So I think his mark on that graphic was 80-something. 90 something because i remember i it was i remember thinking like i wonder if he can get to 100 before the year's out and then i was like oh wait we've got a five t20 series against india coming up after the world cup so yeah, he might he, he might well so most of those sixes were the most the region the tournament probably let's say that the tournament yep. with the most sixes in those 90 odd sixes would be the t20 blast so yes like that is the most ridiculous thing to say like because i remember it vividly it was like oh yeah phillips like it's a shorter boundaries in new zealand it's like fuck have you seen glenn phillips bat bro holy shit um and let's not forget adam milne former footballer football extraordinaire yes, yes i forgot that yeah chatham cup so, winner there you go bit of a crossover um but what about the bowling effort wildcard what'd you it did, it was a New Zealand keeping a lid on it type of bowling performance. Mitchell Santner only bowled one over. Glenn Phillips popped up for an over as well. Nisham got through a few overs. I'm pretty confident. I'm, I, I'm in a bit of a, a bit of a zone with my Black Caps perception where I don't know if I'm like, because I have all these kind of concrete beliefs that I believe have been, um, built over time trends notes insights that we've discussed plenty and it's like built up into these like pretty firm beliefs but now i look through everything i look at everything through through that prism so i don't know if i'm like twisting things to suit my beliefs and my narrative but i am getting like some positive reinforcement like you're saying it's a pure black caps performance that's true top four batsmen scored 100 runs again that's what happens these things that i'm seeing they happen jimmy nation the, the thing with that the top four getting 100 plus runs isn't just like like it's gone past the thing of this is a good example of, like this is a good indicator of whether the black caps are going to win a game or not it's starting to get to the point where it's just like this happens a lot <laughs> like they're ticking the over they're ticking that box more games than not doesn't matter how you do it if you got if the this if I think it's specific, if this top four get a hundred runs, you're gonna win. But Jimmy Nisham, strike rate extraordinaire. Bowling strike rate. What are we doing? I think it's 20. So that's only really important with context. We got Trent Bolt leading wicket taker. His strike is strike rate is 12.9. Tim Salvi, his strike rate is 18. Ishodi, his strike rate is 14. So with Nisham's strike rate of 20, the Black Caps have four bowlers with a strike rate of 20 and below, which is basically means a lot of wickets are going to be taken. But Jimmy Nisham's only bowled 10 overs, and he's got three wickets. And that's all you need from Jimmy Nisham, as, as we've stated plenty throughout this World Cup. Strike rate in this game, 245. Strike rate overall, 173. Like these ideas that I conjured up, now I'm more like, well, this shit's kind of actually happening. So I think it's um, 
a little less insecure about my own takes there. Um, but Jimmy Neesham, strike rate extraordinaire. And we got a varied bowling performance. Trent Bolt, tough night at the, night at the office, fell bolty, but it didn't matter. None of it, like, because Saudi was fantastic. Like, Nishan was pretty good. So it, Phillips is over, didn't necessarily matter too much. Like, well, how do you view this bowling performance, considering it was like a pretty weird bowling performance from what we've seen previously in this World Cup? Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't quite understand the idea of not bowling Mitchell Sander to the left-handers. I didn't. I just don't think it makes that much of a difference because it's not like he's a bowler who's um, who's like success is built upon where he's turning the ball. He's a, he's a little more of a crafter, and I, I think that any real difference for him bowling to a lefty versus a righty is the angle he's able to get. Um, you know, against a right-hander, he can come round the wicket and really sort of dart it in and then straighten it up just a little bit kind of thing. Obviously, that's a preferred method for him. Um, most bat- most spin bowlers prefer to spin the ball away from the bat as well. You just take more wickets that way. Um, but, I mean, I like this is why you have a sixth bowling option like Jimmy Neesham um, and a seventh one like Glenn Phillips. I, I think that the, there was sort of another concession i'm gonna have to come back like i think you've talked about the theories that you've had that have kind of been um reinforced i I think one that was reinforced to me during this game is that a lot of these icc um sort of staff commentators kind of miss the fundamentals of 2020 cricket sometimes not even sometimes quite a lot there's quite a lot of like strategic stuff we'll talk about like i know guys are a lot of these guys are doing ipl and stuff so they're commentating on a lot of 2020s but um, you know, the IPL is very different to a World T20. The IPL, um, how many, it's like four international players per 11, I think, um, which means that seven out of 11 guys are Indians playing in an Indian league. It's a very Indian style versus a very Indian style. It's it's different when you start getting different teams who have their own identities, like what we're talking about at the start. Um and I think the Black Caps' approach was misunderstood in a few different ways. Um, and the idea of just giving Phillips like a cheeky over and he went for like 11 or something. Um, but that's, you know, for a for a gamble um, seventh option kind of um, guy, that's not terrible. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not good enough to warrant a next over, but it's not like he went for 20 and the game changed or anything like that. Um, and it wasn't like they were completely pummeling him either. I, I can't remember... Um, I think it was more just they were scoring off every ball kind of thing. But um, I, I just didn't think that was such a, a failure necessarily. It was, a, it was definitely a little gamble. Didn't quite work. Okay, no, you know, no major harm done or anything like that. We go back to the plan. And um, the, the option, because Santa didn't bowl out last game either, I don't think. Um, the option of having Nisham there, and you know Nisham can bowl good overs in the death. And um, you know he's someone who has a, a good good bowling strike rate as well who might be expensive but you can buy a wicket with him it's the it's the um you know strike rate jimmy nisham is the, the strike rate guy isn't he <laughs> um and i was looking i was i was doing the, the to the best of my understanding because i think a lot of 2020 stats aren't quite under like the, they're different than what you would expect in um in an, in an ODI or a te- like in the same way that test batting averages are higher than ODI batting averages for obvious reasons, you know, 2020 stats are a little more like um, contextual to 2020 cricket in their own ways as well. So like, I think a bowling strike rate of, um, if you're under 20, you're doing pretty good. If you're like in that sort of 18 range, you're doing very good. If you're under 18, that's like top tier. That's like, um, I think each Sodi has a strike rate under 18s. Um, Trent Bolt for this tournament is way under there. Like Saudi, I'd imagine, is, is somewhere close to. He's taking a wicket in every game. Um, like that kind of stuff is, is um, yeah, another aspect that I don't know necessarily is that well understood necessarily. Like, it's a, I don't know. It's a younger sport. Um, you need more time to, to figure these things out. Um, but, yeah, I I thought they, should, they could easily have gotten a couple overs in from Santa, and a, but at the same time, I, th- I don't think anyone else bowled. Even Bolt, like what was what were Bolt's figures? Um, uh, none for forty. 
So not fantastic, but 10 and over is um, like if that, like, I don't think it was a terrible 10 and over, if that makes sense. Like, I think on a different day, that could have taken a couple wickets, a few, um, you know, shots that didn't, they didn't carry or, or whatever those kind of um, scenarios. Obviously, there were five wides in there as well. So, um, and it wasn't like it was a terrible ball down leg side. It was just a bouncer that took a little like that. Um, Owen Morgan said something afterwards about the two pace nature of the wicket. I think that was an example of that, where um, a bouncer that didn't look terrible out of the hand or anything just rocketed. Um, just just got a little bit of trampoline bounce. Like that can happen. Um, and you got to be like. Um, there's a point we're talking about on the Patreon one last time. The black caps just don't bowl no balls. Uh, that's an avoidable thing. You don't give up free hits, whatever. Um, every team's got to accept like that. That's something you can cut out of your game. Mostly, I think England Mark Wood bowled a no ball in this game, and it was the first one England had bowled all tournament. And he was stunned. Like he was measuring his run up out again. He was talking to the umpire. Like, Are you sure about that? Are you, Are you sure I overstepped? I don't. I don't. I don't believe it. I'll have to see a replay. I don't know. Um, he did, but whatever. Like. That's something you can mostly cut out of your game. Wides aren't like wides. You sort of got to, if you want to be able to bowl to the fine margins that you need, if you want to be able to bowl wide Yorkers or bouncers in, in this level, you don't want to be bowling a bouncer that's like nipple height because someone like Daryl Mitchell, for example, is putting that one over the fence. Um, you got to be getting above shoulders, but you can't go above head. It's a small margin. You know, you got to sort of accept that now and then um, you might concede a wide. It comes with the territory. So, and then now and then that wide might accidentally go over the keeper. <laughs> cost you some more so like i i think it wasn't the the um the just outstanding top to bottom bowling effort that we saw against afghanistan but i think even even the worst figures weren't terrible i think there was the sort of thing where like um as i said before there were a lot of overs which could have been a lot better if they just didn't concede that boundary up the sixth ball or whatever but um they they hung tight like no one got absolutely pummeled there were no chris jordan overs in there like the, the chris jordan to jimmy nisham overs um they were they were as tight as they could be expected to be against you know the most destructive batting lineup in in 2020 international cricket everything you say like the words that ring true in my mind are good enough yeah throughout the group stage the black caps as a team they were good enough um, I did watch old uh, Smithy on the cricket, on the rap show. I think it was against Namibia. He wanted them to be more ruthless, more dominant. And like, yeah, well, I'd love that to happen. But the reality is I think this team just deals very, they are very present. You know, they're not like, we need to do this now so that when we get to there, we have like these things checked off. No, it's like, we just need to be present in this challenge here. And what does that mean? It means you're good enough to deal with that challenge there. And the bowling performance was good enough. As you said, no one got like smashed. Three bowlers conceded at eight or less runs and over, which then gives you some leverage for Glenn Phillips. You know, if you don't have good bowlers in your team, you're probably not giving Glenn Phillips a, a, a try, you know, it's because he's going to get smashed as well. But your strike rate breakdown for the bowling, fantastic. So what do you think Trent Bolt's T20... T20 international strike raiders. So for his career, for his I would guess career. I would guess it's somewhere around that 18 mark. Bolty, underrated, underrated. Your that is correct for T20 cricket. So it's T20, which includes the IPL Lords franchise Mahi 18.7, international T20s 15.7. 15.7 there you go underrated that's astounding that's that's <laughs> like that's that that's elite you know there wouldn't be too many guys like active players right now in this era who are doing that tim saudi what do you reckon oh it'd be a little bit higher but i don't think it'd be that much higher um let's go 17.8 18 18 Jimmy Neesham. I know he's got a, I, I, he's, the Jimmy Neesham's a bowler I've thought a lot about because I just love having that kind of option. Who's, he's going to have an RPO of like 9.5, I would imagine. And he's going to have a strike rate of, I'd say 17.5. RPO of 8.99, so nine and strike rate of 7.17.7. 7. 
Beautiful. Do you know what that feels like? We did the, I laid out the batting averages for all the batsmen. So this theory, like even, um, so the theory about the top four batsmen scoring 100 runs, I think that's an option with these four batsmen because they all average 30 with strike rates between 120 and 130. Like over a long, like we sliced it a bunch of different ways, but that's how it broke down. They all, like, if you just go T20 cricket, not internationals, just regular T20 cricket, they're all good. Like, Daryl Mitchell is as good as Kane Williamson. You know, he's, we know he's not. We know he's not as good a batsman, but his T20 career is the same or similar. As productive. It, it, well, yeah, that's a different way of saying it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's they're not quite as good as Devin Conway, but that's the beauty is that Martin is. Guppel isn't as good as Devin Conway and the fact that Mitchell was somewhat comparative to Guppy and Williamson, that is the beauty. Same thing with the bowling. You mentioned he showed his strike rate, one of the best, like it's a legendary T20 international strike rate. But Trent Bolt's not too far away. Tim Sally's not too far away. Jimmy Neesham's not too far away. Santon is a bit more further away, but he does a different job. So it's okay and we mm. can balance it out with other things. But I think in summary, what I realized with that batting average thing was people, I think the whole team as individuals, let alone those intangibles, let alone style of play, the things that make this team who they are, but the individuals are very good at T20 cricket. Because all those, all the top four batsmen, fantastic records. What did Glenn Phillips do? He was the, like, I just said he hit the most sixes in T20 Blast this year. Like Jimmy Neesham, king of the strike rate. And then it's the same for the bowlers. They all have this like undercover excellence in T20 cricket. Because, and this, let's go, this, this tied into like England injuries. Well, Trent Bolt and Tim Southey don't really get injured. Kane Williamson's injured right now, but he's a winner, he's a champion. And it's like, yeah, you can say we didn't have this player, we didn't have that player, but just like all the individuals are low-key, undercover, fantastic T20 players, these dudes play test cricket as well. So where does that put all the other um, cricketers around the world who think they're really good at T20 cricket? Well, what are you doing in test cricket? Because New Zealand's got world-class, multi-format players who get the shit done. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably a bit of dash in a second, so we might be on our last minute or two here, but I, it's the interesting point you just mentioned, because I, they had talked about that, like, you know, Stokes isn't there. Stoke, I, Stokes, I don't think is actually injured. I think he's just sort of coming back from injury and biding his time with cricket and he wasn't going to go to the ashes. Now he is going to go to well, the ashes. Well, ashes is way more important. So don't worry. Who cares? Well, that's the thing. Yeah, you know? Um, and you know, Jason Roy got injured last game, which was unfortunate for him. Joffrey Archer is just constantly injured now. It's just a thing with him. Um, you know, Adam Milne could give him a few tips on what it's like with him like that. You know, we've had, you know, imagine Shane Bond and an actual 20, like getting a decent sort of five to 10 years at the back end of his career in 2020s. Didn't, didn't quite happen the same way because he was in and out with injury. Like that can happen. Some players are more injury prone. Um, what I will say in response to those uh, calls that, you know, England is a little shorthanded. Yes, but um, you all have also got like, you know, I don't know, 20 times the population of Aotearoa. Like it's, it's not even close to the amount of professional cricketers throughout county cricket versus like, what, six domestic teams that New Zealand has. Um, and I mean... Did you see the pictures of, of Jason Roy beforehand? Like at the very start, they only, I don't know if you got it right for the very beginning. And I've been up since three o'clock, man. I'm, I'm running on fumes at this point. Um, but they showed some clips of Jason Roy beforehand, like walking out to the middle. And when they say walking, like hobbling, like he couldn't even put weight on one, on his, on his injured leg. I'm like, get a pair of crutches, bro. Like he's hopping, he's hopping out to the middle of the um, wicket to have a look around. Like, just get someone to carry you if it's the, like it, it feels like one of those for the camera things i don't know like this just hammer i'm not i'm not suggesting it was it just i'm saying it feels like that like let's just make sure we show everyone how uh, one of our you know top batsmen is injured right now i don't know um 
the, the other point was because I was just thinking like Johnny Besto moved up to open instead of Jason Roy. It's like, that's not a bad trade-off. Johnny Besto is pretty bloody good. Um, but they also, in, in between um, not cutting to the All Whites nearly enough, but cutting to Daryl Mitchell's, well, first of all, to the Conway clan quite a lot when Conway was going good. Then when Mitchell took over, cut into the Mitchell clan a whole lot. He also cut to the Besto clan quite a bit. And his sister looks like his, I don't know, if they must be twins or something. Like she looks like, she looks like Johnny Besto, but just female version. Like it, it's almost identical. It's crazy. I am still waiting for someone to just stare at the camera. Someone in the crowd to stare at the camera and just go, fuck you. Never happens, but I'm just hoping one day it happens because it's always funny. Like people seeing themselves on camera and they all want to get giddy. And then I'm just waiting. Yeah. It'll just be a beautiful moment in my lifetime to see someone just give the worst thing you could probably do to an international broadcast. Other than mouth some words or take it further, but let's not take this podcast further. Let's finish on a high. That was a that was a high. Let's consider that a high. Um, on a day, a morning filled with highs and beautiful New Zealand cricket. Didn't even talk about what might come next. They play another game apparently against a different opponent, and we'll deal with it when it comes in beautiful Kane Williamson fashion. Kia kaha, stay beautiful, Churchill.